Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Father Maurice Nutt. I'm the director of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies here at Xavier University of Louisiana. We are so happy to have you at our inaugural Black Catholic History Month. And let me just take a moment to talk about Black Catholic History Month. In 1980, the National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus designated the month of November as Black Catholic History Month for primarily two reasons. One being that St. Martin de Porres, one of the first recognized African Latino saints of the Americas, was canonized in 1962, as well as November is also the month that St. Augustine of Hippo celebrates his birthday. So similarly, as we have African American History Month, November is designated as African American Catholic History Month. This evening's lecture by Dr. Matthew John Kressler is entitled Black Catholics from the Great Migration to Black Power. Isabel Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Sons, the epic story of America's Great Migration, as well as Lawrence Rogers' Canaan Bound, The Great African American Migration, are two books that in detail tell the story of African Americans migrating from the South to cities like Chicago, St. Louis, or Detroit. Dr. Kressler, in his dissertation, decided to take a new look at the Great Migration by looking at their, the journey of African Americans not only from the South coming to the North, but many who converted to Catholicism. He will take us this evening on a journey from the Great Migration to what we will consider the radical Black Power Movement. Let me tell you a little bit about my friend, Dr. Kressler. He's accomplished young, newly minted PhD. In 2006, he received his Bachelor of Arts in History and Theology from St. Bonaventure University. In 2008, he received his Master's of Theological Studies in Religion of the Americas at Harvard University's School of Divinity. In 2014, he completed his PhD in Religious Studies from Northwestern University. He is currently the Assistant Professor of Religion and African and African American Studies at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. What I thought was interesting was some of his presentations that he recently has given. Check these titles out. Black Catholics, Black Power and the Second Vatican Council in Chicago. Black Catholic, Debating Black Power and the Black Catholic Movement, 1968 to 1984. Liturgy as Protest, Black Catholic Masses in the Post-Conciliar United States in Liturgical Imagination and Social Justice. The Soul of Black Catholics, Imagining African and the Black Catholic Diaspora, 1968 to 1984. He has presented in numerous presentations and has written extensively on the topic of Black Catholics in the United States. Without further ado, please welcome to Xavier University of Louisiana, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Matthew John Cressler. How y'all doing? Hi. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it really is my pleasure to join all of you here today. Um, I want to start by thanking Father Maurice for his very kind and all too generous introduction and also thank Maurice and Loretta Solomon for the warm welcome that they've given me. They've not only made my trip down here to see y'all possible, but also have shown me hospitality. Well, I was going to say that you wouldn't believe, but I think that you probably wouldn't believe it. So. Um, I'm truly humbled to be here with all of you. Um, 
And I want to thank you first for coming out tonight. Um, and as I've been talking with Father Maurice about this over the past day, I think it is especially appropriate that I get to be here with you at Xavier through the Institute for Black Catholic Studies to give my first public lecture on my dissertation research because my very first interview was with Sister Jamie Phelps and my very last interview was with Father Maurice Nutt. So I, this is my first visit to the Institute, but I feel like I've been connected to the community uh, in spirit for the last uh, six years or so. Um, so uh, thank you, I'm blessed to be here. Um, and I hope that the stories that I bring here for you all, for you all tonight, uh, you'll not only find interesting, but also provocative. Uh, and I look forward to the question and answer, but then also continuing conversations uh, afterward. Um, so, as you can see from my title, and as Father Maurice said, uh, I'm here tonight to talk about black Catholics from the great migrations to black power. So I want to bring all of you up the imaginary train lines from New Orleans and the Delta up toward Chicago, where I've been traveling from recently. Um, these are the decades that I spend most of my waking and sleeping hours thinking about lately, roughly from the 1930s through the 1970s. And these were years of unprecedented growth for black Catholic communities across the United States. By 1970, never had there been more African Americans who identified themselves as Catholic. These very same years witnessed a profound transformation of black Catholic identity and practice. By 1970, what it meant to be black and Catholic was in a state of intense debate. For this very reason, I've started to think about this story, I've started to call it in my head, the story of black Catholics from conversion to revolution. And I think that you'll get a sense of what I mean by those words over the course of tonight. But before I start into this, this narrative, I want to have, I want to open with one question and with two people. So first, my question that I'm going to return to again and again. A question I'm sure a lot of you have already thought about. What does it mean to be both black and Catholic? Or to ask it another way, what is the relationship between the experience of being black and the experience of being Catholic in these United States of America. Does being black and Catholic entail being either differently? What happens when we put these two words together? These are just some of the questions that I've been wrestling with over the past few years in my research and writing. And what I will argue tonight is that Catholic identity and black identity have been absolutely inseparable from one another for black Catholics. And this inseparability was deeply felt by black Catholics in these years I'm talking about, from the great migrations to black power in the middle years of the 20th century. Over the course of these four decades, tens of thousands of African Americans joined the Catholic Church. And at the very same time, black and Catholic identity underwent a profound transformation. So, I said I was going to introduce you to one question and two people. The two people I want to introduce is to help put a human face on some of these abstract, uh, broad statements. So I want to introduce you to two people from smack dab in the middle of this great migrations to black power period. In 1958, a black Catholic woman and convert wrote a series of letters from her home on the south side of Chicago to the head, of the, Franciscan, the head of the Franciscan Sacred Heart Province, who was based in St. Louis. And among the many, many, many things that she had to say, because she wrote a lot of letters and I've read all of them, Mary Dolores Gadpail offered her own interpretation of the relationship between black identity and Catholic identity. And this image, unfortunately, is not an image, or at least I'm not sure if it's an image of Mary Dolores. It's an image from her church of black Catholic women in prayer. Um, but I don't uh, have an image of her herself, so I'm not quite sure um, if she's in the image. So in these letters that Mary Dolores wrote, she praised the Catholic priests at her parish for being infused with the spirit of Christ-like graciousness 
that made the priests treat people, in her words, not like Negroes so-called, not like second-class citizens, not like inferiors, but as children of the living God. This Christ-like graciousness made Mary Dolores and her fellow African-American parishioners feel like kings and queens, to quote her again. By loving and serving them, these priests helped lift them, quote, up above the color line, up above the natural vicissitudes of everyday life. From Mary Dolores' perspective, just by being Catholic, these priests managed to restore to African Americans a vanished dignity that all the interracial organizations together have not achieved by conference or legislation. Catholicism, in her words, allowed Negroes so-called to transcend the trappings of race. Now, just a year before Mary Dolores wrote these letters in 1958, Lawrence Larry Lucas was strolling the streets of Harlem when he ran into a formidable figure. Wearing the black suit, black tie, and white shirt uniform of a Catholic seminarian, Larry was stopped in his tracks by none other than Malcolm X. When Malcolm asked him what he was about, Larry told him he was going to school. Now I'm going to proceed to get into the dialogue that they had on the streets of Harlem. And you have to imagine, as I do as I'm reading it, Malcolm's great sense of humor and his wide smile. So Larry told, he asked him what he's about, and Larry told him he was going to school. Malcolm retorts, I surmised that. What are you doing there? I'm studying, Larry replied. That's nice. What? To be a Roman Catholic priest. Malcolm looked straight in Larry's eyes and said, and please pardon my language here because I'm just quoting Brother Malcolm. He looked straight in Larry's eyes and said, are you out of your goddamn mind? This encounter, of which there would be many, many more, eventually led Larry Lucas to acknowledge what he called the full, horrible truth, namely that the Catholic Church wrecks black minds. What Lucas meant by this specifically was the Catholic Church, at least according to him, made black people white. This is just a small taste of his provocative book, Black Priest, White Church, Catholics, and Racism. He published the book in 1970, and it served as a manifesto for the revolution that would forever change what it meant to be black and Catholic. And I should note that 40 years later, it was a book that would forever change my life, because when I picked up this book and read it, this was what then launched me into this research project that I'm now um, sharing with you today. Lawrence Lucas eventually became a prominent spokesperson for what came to be known as the Black Catholic Movement, a movement that worked to convince black Catholics that they should be both authentically black and truly Catholic. What I love about these two stories, and this is another image of, of Larry Lucas on the right, is that they demonstrate in such vivid terms the dilemma at the heart of black Catholic history. What does it mean to be both black and Catholic? Or, as Lawrence Lucas would rephrase the question, is it even possible to be both black and Catholic? This dilemma is what the famous historian Albert Rabateau has alluded to when he described that black Catholic experience as an experience of the alternating tension between the pull of Catholic universalism and the demands of racial particularism. So Rabateau has argued that throughout black Catholic history, black Catholics have maintained that the Catholic Church knows no race, and yet at the same time, black Catholics knew all too painfully that race did matter in their church. Black Catholics might praise the church's universality in one breath and actively protest discrimination in the next. And this dilemma comes through really strongly in the lives of Mary Dolores Gad Pale and, Le and Lawrence Lucas. On the one hand, Gad Pale stood in a long line of black Catholics who had appealed to the universality of the Catholic Church in the face of white supremacy. As Mary Dolores put it, 
In place of the second class citizenship that America allots, the Catholic Church has given us a passport to citizenship in heaven. And Mary Dolores' argument echoes back to the 19th century at the very least, when the man celebrated as the first black Catholic priest, a man who is currently being considered for sainthood, Father Augustus Tolton, who I don't have to introduce any of you to, um, celebra he also celebrated the Catholic Church as what he called the true liberator of the race. Yet on the other hand, Lawrence Lucas embodied the new direction that many black Catholics embarked on after the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. Just over one decade after his run-in with Malcolm X on the streets of Harlem, Lucas was now an ordained priest in the Archdiocese of New York and could not have been any further from Mary Dolores' assessment of the church. His bombshell of a book, served as just one of the many rallying cries from a growing number of black Catholic sisters, brothers, priests, and lay people who were inspired by black power. Instead of allowing African Americans to transcend the color line, Lucas insisted that the Catholic Church in this country is a white, racist institution. To quote him, it looks white, it thinks white, it acts white. The only way to save the church for black Catholics, according to Larry Lucas, would be through black power. So, why did I introduce you to these two people to start? <laughs> well, I hope that these two people have at least raised one question for you, which is how in the world did we get from point A to point B in such a short time? If Mary Dolores in 1958 thought that Catholicism could lift African Americans up out of second class citizenship, how did Larry Lucas conclude that the church was a white racist institution just 10 years later? At first blush, I think we might think that this change was inevitable. We might say to ourselves, well, the civil rights movement changed the way African Americans thought of themselves. So naturally, black Catholics would change the ways that they thought of themselves too. And there certainly is some truth to this. But what I'm going to argue today is that that story obscures just how dramatic, even traumatic, this transformation was for black Catholic communities. I'm going to argue that the shift in black Catholic identity from the great migrations to black power was neither inevitable nor was it un uncontroversial. I'm going to argue that what it meant to be black and Catholic changed radically in the middle decades of the 20th century. And that this transformation can teach us a lot, not just about black Catholic history, but about the relationship between religion and race in this place that we call America. And so I'm going to begin by illustrating how and why tens of thousands of African Americans converted to Catholicism in the Great Migrations. Then I'll move to discuss how black power inspired a growing number of black Catholic activists to spark a revolution around what it meant to be black and Catholic. And then I'll conclude by arguing that it was only after more than a decade of struggle that most black Catholics came to think of themselves as authentically black and truly Catholic. From 1940 to 1975, the black Catholic population in the United States grew by 208%, from just under 300,000 people to more than 900,000. This explosive growth was notable not only for its scope, but also for the ways that it realigned the black Catholic population across the country. Black Catholic communities in the Midwest grew by more than 400% in the same period. On the West Coast, they grew by almost 2,500%. Now, I should caveat that, of course, this is because there weren't many black Catholics to begin with, but still, the, 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 the rise is remarkable. By 1975, there were more black Catholics living in the Archdiocese of Chicago than in New Orleans, and more living in Los Angeles than in Baltimore. To give you an even clearer sense of this shift, at the turn of the 20th century, only a few hundred black Catholics lived in Chicago, and they met in one single church. 
By 1975, there were at least 80,000 black Catholics in Chicago. More than New Orleans, more than Washington, D.C., more than Baltimore. And I'm sure more than any other audience in the country, sitting here in New Orleans, the home of black Catholicism, y'all can all appreciate how remarkable that realignment was. Reflecting back on this, two things become clear. First, this growth and realignment was due in large part to widespread African-American conversion. Second, this widespread conversion cannot be understood apart from the context of the Great Migrations. From 1915 to 1970, millions of African-Americans moved en masse from the rural south to the urban industrial centers across the north and west. These migrations resulted from a convergence of a lot of different factors, and the search for better jobs was one of those factors. But black migrations also represented bold political and social protest statements. With white supremacy resurgent through legal segregation and extra legal lynching, many of those African Americans who could leave the South did. In fact, Many migrants experienced leaving the Jim Crow South as an exodus comparable to the biblical flight of the Hebrews out of Egypt. The result was an unprecedented movement of people that transformed American culture and society forever. To give you a sense of the sheer scope of this, in 1900, less than 740,000 African Americans lived outside of the South, just about 8% of the national black population. By 1970, almost half of all African Americans lived outside of the South, more than 10 and a half million people. And uh, The Warmth of Other Sons was referenced by Father Maurice. I highly, highly, highly recommend you read that book if you're interested in it more in The Great Migration. It's a, a beautifully crafted work. But what I want to talk about today is how The Great Migrations was about a lot more than just numbers. The Great Migrations irrevocably changed what it meant, what it looked like, what it sounded like, what it felt like to be black in America. Today I'm going to talk about just one of those changes, how the Great Migrations transformed what it meant to be black and religious. When black families made their exodus out of the Egypt land of the South, many of them traveled with their churches, with their ministers, at the behest of their church elders. Many of these migrants were steeped in southern black evangelical culture. Many of them were Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals. And they were steeped in ways of being religious that W.E.B. Du Bois famously called the preacher, the music, and the frenzy. So as these migrants moved up the trains from the Delta into the North and into the West, black migrants brought with them the distinctive cadence of black preaching the rhythms and blues of black church music, the ecstatic styles of praise and worship that could involve seemingly spontaneous shouting and bodily movement. And when they arrived in cities like Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, New York, Buffalo, Los Angeles, Oakland, these new ways of being black and religious were born in these cities. So when migrants ar arrived in a place like Detroit, if they found the worship styles in their local AME church too restrained, or the preaching of their local, uh, local Baptist minister uninspired, if they found the music of their local choir to be unmoving, they simply got up and left and founded their own churches. And as a result, those established churches now found themselves in competition with what could be called startups, more and more of these established churches started to adopt the rhythm of gospel music, the cadence of southern black preachers, the freedom of worship of, music, of movement in worship. Sorry. And as a result, African American religious life in the South, North, and West would never be the same. Growing numbers of black Christians in cities like Chicago and Detroit began to feel the power of the Holy Spirit possessing their bodies an experience that could lead to dancing, shouting, weeping, and even shaking so strong that congregants had to hold each other upright. Members of churches learned to encourage their speakers with shouts of preach and amen. 
Crowds throng to hear Hammond organs propel gospel choirs. So in other words, the Great Migrations brought ways of being black and religious that had once been thought of distinctively Southern and remade them in cities in the North and West. I'm going to pause here. I don't need to lecture all of you on this, but something that should be noted is that not all African Americans were evangelicals. And if the Great Migrations changed what it meant to be black and religious by popularizing Southern evangelical culture, the Great Migrations also gave birth to a number of creative alternatives to black evangelical Christianity. Now I'm going to go off in a direction you might not have seen coming, so just bear with me. I, I promise it's going to make sense. The first half of the 20th century witnessed a collective effort among a significant minority of African Americans to forge new religious and racial identities. Charismatic black innovators established new religious movements like the Black Hebrews, the Moorish Science Temple of America, and most famously, the Lost Found Nation of Islam. All of these movements argued that African Americans should reject their Christian identity and their Negro racial identity, and insisted that in order to successfully combat white supremacy, black people had to first accept their true religious and racial selves. So at the heart of these new movements was embracing new ways of dressing, eating, speaking, naming oneself, praying, and worshiping. And these new ways were intended to distinguish members not only from white Christians, but also from black evangelical Christians who were populating the, the neighborhoods that they were moving into. And these are some images of um, women in the Nation of Islam, um, and some men and a uh, uh, father and his son in the Moore Science Temple on the bottom right. And uh, it's, it's so far away, it's hard to tell, but I can bring it up later. Um, an image of the Moore Science Temple um, wearing their distinctive garb. Okay. So I imagine that at this point you might be asking yourself, what does any of this have to do with black Catholics, right? Well, what I want to say is that it's precisely this context in which many southern black migrants first encountered the Catholic Church. When black migrants arrived in cities across the north and west, they changed the face of cities that were predominantly white and Catholic. Neighborhoods that were majority white and Catholic might become majority black and non-Catholic in just a matter of years. And faced with these changes, white priests and sisters had a few options on their hands. One, they could violently resist what was taken to be a black invasion of Catholic turf. And though I'm not talking about this here today, that was an option that was um, actually wielded by a number of white priests in neighborhoods across the country. A much more common response would be to slowly and steadily close up shop and abandon Catholic churches for want of parishioners. The third option is the one that was crucial for black Catholics. An exceptional few priests and sisters began to devote their undivided attention to the conversion of black neighborhoods to Catholicism in an attempt to fill the pews with black Catholic converts. And here, by exceptional, I mean it literally. They tended to be the exception rather than the rule. But this significant minority of white priests and sisters started to imagine black neighborhoods as foreign missionary fields. This is an image of one of the most famous missionaries in the south side of Chicago, the class of um, uh, girls who just completed First Communion. These missionaries opened their schools to black students, whether or not those students were Catholic, and most were not. In order to enroll in Catholic schools, which were often the best options for black communities surrounded then as now by substandard public education, black students and their parents had to attend Catholic mass and religious instruction, regardless of whether they were Catholic. And through schools as well as door-to-door -door invitation, missionaries introduced newcomers to the Catholic Church. And over the course of the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, tens of thousands of African Americans converted. Now, 
While it might strike you as strange or counterintuitive, I think it's important to think of black Catholics as part of the same impulse shared by black Hebrews and black Muslims. The Catholic Church and the Great Migrations represented one of the creative alternatives that were available to African Americans who were unsatisfied with increasingly popular and pervasive black evangelical culture. When converts embraced Catholic rituals and practices, they were in some sense setting themselves apart from black Baptist and Pentecostal churches that were proliferating around them. So again, to put a human face on this, let's return to Mary Dolores Gadno. Though she was not herself a migrant, she was a convert and paradigmatic of this black Catholic identity in the midst of the Great Migrations. When she converted in 1949, she made a promise to God that she would stay at his feet as did Mary. And what she meant by this was the daily performance of rituals and practices central to Catholic life at that time. And here are a few examples of that. So you have um, some little girls at prayer as well as some men at prayer. And in the top right corner, which is hard to make out, you have um, a pre-Vatican II experience of the communion. Mary Dolores committed herself to daily holy mass, daily communion, the rosary, the way of the cross, weekly confession, constant direction of a priest, the practice of spiritual and corporal works of mercy. She pledged to attend Mass every day of the rest of her life, barring illness, and was especially moved by the beauty of Latin chanting, which, to quote her, even though one does not understand it wholly, it has a rhythm, harmony, and mystery that lifts one out of this world. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the vast majority of black converts did not attend Mass daily, nor did they write oodles of letters to the provincial of the local Franciscan order praising him for his Latin pronunciations. Nevertheless, many of the sources I've found from black converts in the same period echo a lot of Mary Dolores' sentiments. So one woman admired the dignity of Catholic worship in spite of the fact that her grandfather insisted she avoid Catholics. Her grandfather was a Methodist minister. Another convert attributed his conversion to the one true church, as he called it, to the quietness of the Mass. Even though he did not understand the Latin Mass, he said he would feel different when he entered the doors. And this assertion that the Catholic Mass was somehow quiet or dignified was quite common among converts in this time. And what I want to do is contextualize those comments in the Great Migrations, because a Latin Mass was not considered quiet or dignified in a vacuum, right? It was considered quiet and dignified in contrast to the shouting and clapping that was increasingly becoming common in Black Baptist and Pentecostal churches. So what I'm arguing here is that Black Catholic populations boomed in the midst of the Great Migrations, in part because the Catholic Church offered an alternative way of being black and religious. I'm going to venture a guess here and say that most of us don't think of black Muslims and black Jews when we think of black Catholics, or at least that's not the first thing that comes to our mind. Um, but during these great migrations, black Catholics shared in a similar impulse to these other communities. Black Catholics, black Muslims, and black Hebrews all position themselves as alternatives to the black church as traditionally conceived. When converts praise the, the quiet dignity of the Latin mass, or when they championed the one true church, they were forging a new way of being black and religious. So when Mary Dolores Gadpale celebrated the ability of the Catholic church to lift African Americans up above the color line, if you remember that quote that I had earlier, Part of what she was celebrating was the ways that Catholic practices set black Catholics apart from other black religious communities, especially black evangelical churches. And here is my segue. This is exactly what Lawrence Lucas was going to have such a huge problem with. So how do we get to Lawrence Lucas? What happened between 1958? when Mary Dolores was celebrating the Catholic Church's power to lift African Americans up above the color line, and 1968, 
When Lawrence Lucas was just one of many people criticizing the church as a white racist institution. The sheer fact that there's only 10 years between these two things should strike us all as quite remarkable and know for us how dramatic this change was. This is why part of why I call it a revolution. The drama, and as I said, the trauma of this moment was largely born of black power. Beginning in the late 1960s and continuing through the 1970s, a growing number of black Catholic sisters, brothers, priests, and lay people rallied to the banner of black power. These black Catholic activists, as I'm going to call them throughout, were compelled by the assertion of black independence and the celebration of black identity ushered in by black power. And as you can imagine, this perspective was quite contentious. It directly challenged many of the ways black Catholics had lived their religious lives up to that point. Black Catholic communities across the United States would soon find themselves bitterly divided over how one should be or whether one could be both black and Catholic. But before I get ahead of myself, I want to offer you a quick definition of what I mean by this word black power, right? Two of the most contentious words uh, in recent American history. Black power, as I'm understanding it, represented a bold shift, a broad, sorry, a broad shift, it was also bold, but a broad shift in the black freedom struggles, the result of a rising black racial and political consciousness. The young, charismatic civil rights activist Stokely Carmichael famously signaled this shift in a speech that he gave for the Meredith March for Freedom in Greenwood, Mississippi in 1966, after he'd spent yet another stint in jail. This is to quote Stokely. This is the 27th time I've been arrested. I ain't going to jail no more. The only way we're gonna start, or the only way we're gonna stop them white men from whooping us is to take over. We've been saying freedom for six years and we ain't got nothing. What we're gonna start saying now is black power. I can't do it justice. You can imagine uh, the eruption of the These two words, black power, inspired activists across the country at the same time that they struck fear and anxiety into the hearts of many Americans, both black and white. So I think it's most helpful to understand black power not as some monolithic movement, but instead as a constellation of principles and practices that emphasize black self-determination and black self-definition. Across ideological and tactical divides, a variety of different organizations ranging from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to the Black Panther Party to the US organization all insisted that black people should have the power to determine the destiny of their own communities and to define black identity for themselves. And I was really happy to include a picture of Angela Davis here, who I just found out from the newspaper, um, was here, I think, a week or two ago. Um, so we're, we're sitting and standing on hollow grounds here. In the wake of, hey y'all, good to have you here. Excited to see you. Um, in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination, more and more black Catholics joined the ranks of those inspired by people like Angela Davis, by organizations like the Black Panther Party. A bullet brought Martin Luther King's ministry to a tragic end on April 4th, 1968. Urban rebellions rocked the cities across the country in the days following his death. Militarized police forces responded brutally to those rebellions. Chicago's Mayor Richard M. Daley, probably most infamous for ordering his police to shoot to kill any possible looters. And on April 16th, just 12 days after King's death, over 60 black Catholic priests gathered in Detroit along with some sisters and brothers and lay people to found the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus, the BCCC, as I'm going to call it. It's a long name. <laughs> Those gathered, which included black sisters and brothers, shared the shock and outrage of African Americans across the country and produced a statement that exploded across the American Catholic press and awakened the nation to black Catholic protests. 
The statement opened boldly. This is a quote. The Catholic Church in the United States, primarily a white racist institution, has addressed itself primarily to white society and is definitely a part of that society. According to the BCCC, the church was not cognizant of changing attitudes in the black community and is not making the necessary realistic adjustments because the present attitude of the black community demands that black people control their own affairs. Sister Martin de Porres Gray, who herself was present at the founding of the BCCC, founded the National Black Sisters Conference later that same year. There, black women religious pledged themselves to work unceasingly for the liberation of black people. In their words, they declared that expressions of individual and institutional racism found in society and within the church are categorically evil and inimical to freedom of men everywhere. The sisters dedicated themselves to the eradication of powerlessness, poverty, and the distorted self-image of victimized black people and the promotion of a positive self-image among ourselves and in our black folk, especially in our black youth, as well as the stimulation of community action aimed at the achievement of economic, social, and political black power. National Black Lay Catholic Caucus formed the next year. The National Office for Black Catholics formed the next year. And a little later down the line, about a decade later, the Institute for Black Catholic Studies would be founded. So this was a moment, the late 60s and the 1970s, a moment of tremendous black Catholic institution building that would forever change the face of black Catholic America. These organizations sparked what would be known as the Black Catholic Movement. And this movement fought for a number of things, but what I want to focus on today is an aspect of the movement that returns us to our opening question. What does it mean to be both black and Catholic? Mary Dolores Gadpale, among others, felt that the Catholic Church allowed her to transcend the color line. It provided a universal religious identity that lifted African Americans up above the particularity of race. Black Catholic activists, Lawrence Lucas most prominent among them, had a fundamental issue with this perspective. They, in a sense, paraphrased Malcolm X and said that black Catholics had been hoodwinked, bamboozled, and led astray. Lawrence Lucas and fellow black activists, black Catholic activists, said that while converts like Mary Dolores had been told that the one true church knew no race, what they had actually been introduced to were white and European ways of being religious. They argued that throughout its history in the US, the Catholic Church had effectively forced black converts to choose between white Catholicism and their black identity. In other words, one of the biggest objectives for the black Catholic movement was nothing short of making black Catholics black. But this, of course, begs the question, what does it mean to be black? To answer this question, activists in the movement again drew inspiration from black power. They argued that African Americans shared ways of knowing and living in the world that connected them to black people across Africa and the Americas. To quote Sister Martin de Porres Gray again, blackness is that unique way of speaking, writing, dancing, singing, cooking, dressing, drawing, acting, and behaving, all of which is innate to black people in America. And certain ways of being religious were a part, essential part of this definition. So Brother Joseph M. Davis, the executive director of the National Office for Black Catholics in the 1970s, used the word soul to describe what he called the fundamental worldview and lifestyle of black people as it has been retained from our African heritage. And I did this when I said soul because whenever he wrote it anywhere in his papers, it was always capitalized and underlined. So it's hard to, to demonstrate that. Um, but he, you know, this, this was a, a key word for him. And what he meant by this was that black people had come to this country as a spiritual people and that their spirituality was experienced with the fullness of one's being. In his words, the head, 
the heart, the body, the hands, the feet, the soul. So how would black Catholic activists make the church black? Here, again, I want us to think back to the beginning of my talk when I was discussing the great migrations and the spread of black evangelical Christianity. So when people like Mary Dolores had converted to the Catholic Church, what they were doing in part was setting themselves apart from the hallmarks of black evangelical Protestantism, setting themselves apart from call and response sermons, from gospel music, from praise and worship in a particular way. Now, influenced by black power, black Catholic activists began to insist that these were the very things that defined what it meant to be black and religious. The only way it would be possible to be both black and Catholic according to the black Catholic movement would be for black Catholics to recognize that they too were inheritors of the black church, even if they were in a predominantly white one. And a large part of this effort to trans involve the transformation of the mass. And this is one image from an early experimentation with a black unity mass, as it was called. Now, I've, this kind of is a caveat that goes for my entire talk. I've written an entire paper on this one subject. Um, so there's much more room uh, in question and answer even after to talk in greater depth about a lot of these points. Um, but I want to focus on just one example, which is the Black Unity Mass that was hosted on the south side of Chicago in January 1969. Can you tell I'm coming from Chicago? Like half my examples are from Chicago. <laughs> I, you know, I fell in love with the city. Um, so in Chicago, in 69, Lawrence Lucas participated in a celebration of the Mass unlike any he had ever experienced. Thousands of people crammed into a church service that was over three hours long. The Chicago Tribune called the choir, uh, and this doesn't make a lot of sense, other black Catholics who still remained uncertain about black power. Many feared that black Catholic activists had embraced racial particularism over and against Catholic universalism. One critic of the Black Unity Mass lamented that, quote, the Mass had once been dignified, reverent, and solemn. According to these black bishops in 1984, it meant being both authentically black and truly Catholic. Not only was this possible, it was the gift that black Catholics had to offer for the Catholic Church. But, and this is my argument, this was an answer that they only had over de after decades of struggle on the behalf of black Catholic sisters, brothers, priests, and lay people who fought for a revolution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kressler. At this time, we will take a few questions. Um, if you could stand up and be very loud because we don't have a microphone. Dr. Kressler, if I could just add, or, or even if you could speak upon the very first movement, the black Catholic movement, was among laity because we did not have priests, we did not have bishops. So it has always been from the very origins of our movement, a late run movement. Yeah, the colored Catholic Congresses the colored in the 19th Catholic century. Movement. Yeah, I actually, because of, I was constantly Congress. trying to make sure that it gets down to 45 minutes. I had a shout out to Daniel Rudd uh, earlier in the paper, um, who was a lay Catholic, a publisher, um, <laughs> and activist who is a founder of these colored Catholic Congresses. So yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's important to highlight the tension, but I'm, I'm really, uh, I'd be really anxious to kind of make a clear line between vowed religious and, and lay people. Any other questions, comments, please? Uh, yes. Yeah. Just stand up so we can Yeah, that's, that's a great question. It, the black Catholic movement as it's rising in the late 60s and 70s are latching on immediately to rising liberation theology, particularly from black theological and womanist theological traditions. So when Lawrence Lucas, when Sister Martin de Porres Gray, um, when Joseph Brown, when all of these activists in the black Catholic movement are articulating what it means to be black and Catholic, they're drawing on James Cohen 
They're drawing on Albert Klee. They're drawing on Black Messiah. They're drawing on this notion of the black church tradition as an inherently prophetic tradition. Um, that is, yeah, as, as, you, as, you, as you point out, is kind of on the rise at this very same moment. So you could, I could, it could have been, you know, I, black theology and black power is always kind of right next to each other. Yeah. No, uh, the reason why I'm saying because I, I actually had a chance to meet Dr. Lucas. Um, Lauren, I was talking to Lauren Lucas back in the 80s when he had a church in Harlem, right? But about three blocks away from the mid-year, one of the biggest projects in New York um, during that time. But one of the things they did, just very quickly, is Lauren Lucas, they had a big and that did the struggle with, like, uh, San Diego and Nicaragua against communism to their own struggle for black liberation. So their actual situation was like international. Mm -hmm. And like, I was surprised that I never met a black Catholic since I've been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we, I should talk more with you. That sounds really, really <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Now to like, the bridge of cities like Chicago and places like Harlem and places like Oakland. But yeah, that's, and actually, afterward, I can tell you about a friend of mine who wrote a dissertation on this kind of same period, but on Louisiana, actually. Thank you, due diligence, and um, presenting the topic. Um, what I think about is the intersectionality of cross spirituality and the most publicity of that things we have. So definitely, I think, the Zeitgeist at the time was around the idea that African Americans were looking for once again the uplift of the movement. And so in that migration and finding faith or whatever was very important and, and connecting to potentially the Catholic Church, which seemingly was a little bit ahead of some Baptist churches. My, my question then becomes, what do we see in terms of allyship? Well, I think the idea of the black power movement is great, but we have to be as well to understand what becomes the allies. So my question is, what, what do we see in terms of allyship in the Catholic Church and from our non-African American Catholics who, who saw the movement going forward and what becomes their role and, and do you have anything to say to those guys? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so first I should say that in some ways the rise of, I mean this won't surprise you Brian, but in some ways the rise of black power and the black Catholic movement challenge a lot of the white Catholic sisters and brothers and priests um, who had seen their roles in black communities to be a missionary relationship with the communities that they're a part of, um, as well-intentioned as they were. Um, and so this was a real challenge. I mean, 
Black Catholics inspired by black power were challenging to white Catholic liberals in the same way that black power activists were challenging to all white liberals at the time. Um, but uh, through the black, the black Catholic movement also had a, a huge role in educating white Catholic priests and sisters um, who would then go back and serve these communities. So I mentioned kind of one conference, white priests, black church. In my interviews with, um, with people who lived through this period in Chicago, you know, I, I heard stories about how it was a white priest, not a black priest, who introduced the black Madonna to the church. A white priest who had been to Africa doing missionary work who introduced the African nativity. Um, so uh, very quickly, among some black, or among some white priests and sisters, there's an embrace by this. At the same time that it causes a real big dilemma for um, people who had, understood, had understood themselves to be um, well-intentioned um, and then found themselves challenged by the critique. But um, I, I see it as a moment um, actually, as, as with all of black power, that is not antithetical to um, allies, particularly to white coalition building, um, but that sees it as having to occupy a particular space, so one that's cognizant of um, the problems inherent in those kinds of coalition building. But yeah, you definitely see those, those coalitions don't die off when black power starts. So. that I think some of the conflict uh, in this moment was between people who had converted to Catholicism of a particular variety, namely pre-Vatican II, pre-Black Power Catholicism, and Black Catholics who were embracing a new way of being Catholic. But I, I wouldn't say, I mean, this is part of what I, I want to kind of challenge us about, is I don't want to make it, um, I don't want to caricature people on either side, right? So I. Part of what my dissertation attempts to do is to rehumanize, re to a certain extent, black Catholics before black power who found Catholic ritual like the Latin Mass quite compelling and powerful. Um, so I wouldn't want to say that, I wouldn't want to paint this picture where you have people kind of embracing this sad, somber Catholicism and juxtaposition to people embracing this happy, joyful Catholicism. But I, what I'm trying to illustrate is that you have two different understandings of what it means to be black and Catholic, um, and uh, that that understanding is really changing. Um, and so when the black bishops in 84 say that black Catholics should be authentically black and truly Catholic, um, that that statement is something that um, would not have been possible in the 40s or 50s before this movement, um, you know, in, that, in, the, in the particular way that they're saying it. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to kind of mess up those borders, kind of make them a little bit more blurry between these different communities. So. Correct. Um, from your studies, what would you find might be a reaction or say um, a response from other Catholics within the U.S. and outside of the U.S. in response to the combination, the rising combination of black power with the opposite? Mm -hmm. like, how do they see it? What do they see that? Yeah, the, uh, particularly just focus on the, the part of outside of the U.S. I mean, this is where this impetus to kind of transform African-American Catholicism with black power, kind of like uh, I think Brian was pointing out, or it might have been someone else, um, was, inter oh no, it was the comment in the back about the internationalizing of it. It was intentionally international. So Freeing the Spirit, one of the publications I flashed up toward the end, a publication on black liturgy, was from its very first issue publishing conversations between Caribbean, black Caribbean liturgists, African liturgists <coughs> who are, who are transforming. You know, so you have priests in Tanzania and Nigeria experimenting with African masses and talking to African American priests in Chicago, in LA, in Cleveland, 
about how they can integrate African drums, for instance, into the mass. So it was, I mean, I think that part of what black power does, because black power outside of the Catholic Church is this very international move, um, it introduces that international, not that black Catholics hadn't always been international, but um, in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, when there's lots of experimentation in, um, in African worship, in Caribbean worship, and, and kind of worship across the black uh, diaspora, you have that influencing communities in the U.S. too. So, yeah, that's a great question. If I could, oh, well. I was going to take the last question, but I have to yield to my elder, Father Victor Cohia. If you would take it, and I will follow you. asking the final question of you, uh, Dr. Kressler, I'm going to mention the elephant in the room. You being a Caucasian intellectual, what compelled you to focus on African American Catholics and to write your dissertation on our history and our involvement? Thank you for addressing the elephant in the room. This is the elephant in the room I have to deal with um, in my classes back at Earlham, too, being a white professor teaching a class currently on black power uh, in an African American studies department. Um, and this is something we talked about earlier today. I mean, I, um, for me, what drew me first into African American history and later into black Catholic history um, was my growing passion around issues of social justice particularly the prophetic and liberation theological tradition, um, specifically in Catholicism, but uh, broader. And as I was thinking about it um, earlier today, I mean, if you get passionate about social justice and prophetic traditions in the context of the U.S., it won't be long before what you're studying is African-American history and African-American studies, right? Um, and so that was really what drew me into the study of African-American history. So as an undergrad, I wrote my... Um, I wrote a thesis on feminist liberation theology, and I wrote a thesis on Martin Luther King's last three years. Um, as, a, as a master's student, I maintained interests in African American religious history and in Catholic history. And it was, I was a little late to the game, but it was only when I got to my PhD program and I read books like Black Priest, White Church, books like Cyprian Davis's The, black, uh, the History of, of Black Catholics in the United States, that I realized that I was making this false distinction, right, between African American history and Catholic history. Um, so that was when I, um, you know, over the, you know, really the past six, seven years of my life, I've dedicated to the study of, of black Catholics. So, but it was, for me, it's really the, the unique prophetic position of black people in America that has drawn me into that um, study, uh, both in and out of the classroom, in and out of the lecture hall, so. Just to respond to that, my dear friend, I want to say to those who are gathered here, um, in your research, I know you had a plethora of black Catholic leaders, activists, if you will, and you know, we can be somewhat suspicious and, and look at you like, as an outsider, what are you doing? Are you trying to examine us? But what I want those who are here to understand about this gentleman is that he's the real deal. In other words, he not only researched, but he always showed up and was involved in the black Catholic community. I started to think that he was a, somewhat of a stalker because <laughs> anything that was black and Catholic in Chicago while I was there, he was always present. 
involved and engaged in our community. So that makes him truly authentic in which he's bringing his research here. And that's why I wanted to give him a platform to begin to speak on his research. And we're very honored here at Xavier University of Louisiana, the Institute for Black Catholic Studies, to have you. God bless you. Thank you. Present, if any others would like to engage him in comments, and Brother Herman got his hand up, so it must be important. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>